He paid for all of the sins, for all of the people, for all of time. You know, it doesn't take a double doctoral or a master's work. I'm not poking fun at anybody. Be who God created you to be, please. Always boils down to our relationship with Jesus. That it, that relationship affects everything in our lives. God chose Israel. Our founding fathers chose God. Be a doer of the word. Because faith without works is dead, for real. That's religion, that's knowledge, that's intellect. You need to go out there and engage with your world and own your liberty. <clears throat> so I'm gonna do something that I've, I've kind of always wanted to do, uh, but I've never done. I'm gonna, <laughs> amen. I'm going to attempt to, to teach. Uh, I'm way better at teaching like one-on-one -on -one in my office or with someone I'm discipling uh, because it, you know, when I'm up here, I got like the, I'm a preach, if you haven't noticed. Um, there is some teach in my preach, but uh, I know that I, uh, I minister for uh, the purpose of, uh, of reconciliation unto the Lord. I know that I I minister uh, to, to give people an opportunity to be, um, to repent, to change. I, hopefully I inspire. I know that uh, some people are inspired by what I preach to change themselves and some other people are inspired to change the world, both of which I'm cool with. That's kind of one of the purposes of preach is to do that stuff. And then some of you just tolerate me, so whatever whatever other category I fit in on that. But teaching is not something I do very well from the pulpit because, man, when I get on something, I'd, like, after it. And so you, in teach, you got to be very calm, cool, and collected, which is probably, thank you. <laughs> that laugh said it all. So I'm going to teach. Everybody say amen. amen. <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling it. You are going to need a Bible. If you did not bring one, we will give you one for free to have and to hold till death do you part, which you'll never part from the Word of God. If you have a Bible app, that'll be good too. The reason I'm saying this is because I'm going to do a ton of scriptures because I'm going to teach. Remember I said that? So I'm going to teach, and so there's going to be a ton of scriptures. So I'm not going to be preaching on them. I'm going to teach, which means you're going to have to go home with the Holy Spirit and let him preach. Because if you don't say that you're going to do that, then I'm going to have to preach all of these. And man, it's going to be a minute. So if you can promise me that you'll let the Holy Spirit do the preaching, I'll just do the teaching. Amen? Amen? All right, so raise your hand if you need a Bible, and one of these two lovely folks will give you one. So the I'm going to kind of build this on 3 John verse, uh, well, it's chap there's no chapter in 3 John, but chapter 1 your Bible app or something might say a one on there. So this is going to come from 3 John uh, chapter 1, and I'm going to read verses 2, 3, and 4. And you guys might remember that we just got through a series called Soul Success prior to getting into King and Kingdom. If you are in King and, King and Kingdom and you're like, oh man, this is, there's a lot going on here, and this is really great, and you want some foundation to king and kingdom, you should go back and get soul success. I think it's on one of the USB uh, keys to the kingdom sticks on the free materials. Get soul success. Uh, Ryan says all the time that that was his favorite uh, series uh, yet. <laughs> his favorite series yet. I'll, I'll give him some uh, room. Uh, but the, that series was kind of based on this premise, which is if your soul is prospering, this is why I do this every single Sunday at the end of service. Because to the degree that your soul prospers is to the degree that you will be prospering in every other area of your life. Amen. To the degree that your soul is not prospering, and some people are literally in poverty in their soul. Literally in poverty. And then they wonder why they're sick all the time and all these other things are bad. You can, uh, you can honestly measure 
the, one of the thermometers of your spiritual life will be your soul, the condition of your soul. Amen. Beloved, that's you. I wish, and that word for wish is the word prayer with hopeful expectation. Not prayer that you can pray in faith and declare and have, but hopeful expectation type of wish. I wish above all things. This is what the Father desires for you. This is the word of God. Je Jesus said in John 17, 17, that thy word is truth. Sanctify them through thy word. This is the truth that God above all things desires. Now this is for the beloved. So what God desires for people that are outside of the family is for them to come into the family. But this is for the beloved. So for the people in the family, what God desires, what beloved church desires, what Steve Castle desires, what all the people that have our culture desires, above all other things, is that you prosper and be in health. Now, this isn't health like um, you're not dying. Because a lot of people, <laughs> that's, that's their definition of health. Are you healthy? Uh, I didn't have any limbs fall off last night. Well, that's not healthy, not by what God, that might be what society says that healthy is. You're just not in the hospital, so you must be healthy. No, that's not. God's version of healthy is his version. How healthy is God? It's the same thing with prosperity. What's God's version of prosperity? Heaven. So his version of prosperity is heaven. His version of health is heaven. So whatever degree that you're not experiencing that, he wants you to. He, he wants you to. But he also knows that the way that you live out your physical existence on this planet is going to be a derivative of what you are allowing to flow through or into your soul. If you're allowing the spirit of God to flow out of your soul, it is going to flow out of your soul. It is going to saturate your body, saturate your mind, saturate the relationships around you. It's going to saturate everything like a river of living water flowing out of you, just like a fireman. Right, Zach? Like, wah. Okay, Zach's a fireman, so he knows. Uh, but to the degree that your soul is not prospering, your soul is locked up, you're mucked up, you're mad, you're offended, you're... Uh, you're in unforgiveness, you're, uh, you're fighting against what God's trying to do through God's, through his people or through his word or through your own way or you're all about pride or self-centeredness or whatever. Any of that stuff is going to muck up your soul. And so then all of this stuff that God wishes above all things flows out into your life. It's not going to get through the walls that you build, the doors that you shut. And oftentimes what happens in these situations is people blame God. Well, God, why aren't you healing me? God's like, hey, why don't you let my healing flow from my spirit through your soul into your body? No, 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 that's way too hard. You just heal me. I can't because I gave you the authority over what happens on this physical planet and in your physical body. I will not usurp your will. And if you will to be broken through your attitude, through your behaviors, through your lifestyle, you will have what you will to have. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And he that sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that sows to the spirit shall of the spirit reap corruption. Life everlasting. It's not God. God's got almost zero to do with what is going on in the manifestations of your life as it relates to your prosperity, your, uh, your soulish health, or your physical health. Amen. And by almost nothing, all I mean is that he paid for it. Right. Paid for it, stacked it up. It's in a great big bank account called Spirit and he wants you to make all the withdrawals that you can. But many people won't come to him boldly, enter into the throne room of grace, so they may obtain 
grace and mercy at a time of need. Verse 3 says, for I rejoice. See, I didn't preach this in soul success, and I, I kind of like felt bad that I didn't get into this stuff in soul success, because I was like, Lord, this is literally the only verses in here that he literally talks about what the success of your soul is. And the Lord comforted me, and he said, you will. And here we are. For I rejoiced greatly. So this is John writing a letter to uh, Gaius, is his name, G-U-I-S, uh, and he was, uh, this was a minister that what came up underneath him, kind of like a spiritual son, but this could also be the father in heaven writing to us, his spiritual sons. So either way you want to do that, God rejoices or the apostle John rejoices or pastor Steve rejoices went greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you. Now, a lot of people would say, no, what's going to make God rejoice is the love that's in me. Okay, the mercy that's in me, the patience that's in me, the whatever, whatever your like click Christian word is, that's what you think God is going to rejoice that you're doing really good at. But what the Bible says is that the Father rejoices when the truth is in you because the truth fixes everything. Love doesn't fix everything. Grace doesn't fix everything. Mercy doesn't fix everything. The truth is what makes you free. When you are free, now you can love. Now you can mercy. Now you can grace. Now you can grow. Now you can be prosperous. But you have to be free first. And truth always brings freedom. I read, uh, testified of the truth that is in thee, even as you walk in the truth. Now check it out. There's truth in you. And what was making him rejoice was that there was truth in you and you were walking in it. There's a lot of folks that have truth in them and not really a whole lot of truth walking out in them. Like, well, I know that the, the government shouldn't da 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 Well, what are you doing about it? Complain? That's what we've done for 50 years and look what's happened. We're all a bunch of little slaves to the tyrannical government that we have. So if we do less complaining and more walking, there'd be things that would change. The next verse is, uh, it, it goes even deeper into the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Amen. This is why if you, if you paid attention to the way the Lord ministered, People would ask him questions, and it was like he would ignore them and answer some other thing. And it, and it wasn't. He was actually answering the right question, and he was doing what needed to happen to bring truth into the person's actual question. And this is something that I've found in my own life that I know that if I can help people get into the truth which is why I talk about humility and submission so much because you cannot get under the flow of his truth without submitting to the fact that he's smarter and some of the people that he brought into your life are smarter. Yep. <laughs> One yep. And humility means that you're actually going to receive it no matter where it comes from. I mean, if my 98-pound mother tells me that I'm doing something stupid, how dare her? I'm bigger than her. I can beat her in an arm wrestle. And, and I know that you're laughing, but a lot of people think this way in like the spirit. Well, I'm quote unquote bigger than them in the spirit. How could they tell me anything? I know more than that guy. So how could he say anything to me about my life? That's not humility. You, re you do realize there was... Let me just use one example. There was one time that the prophet of the entire nation of Israel had to be corrected by a donkey. Amen. That should wake up anybody that knows that story. Because I have, I'll tell you this, that there's a lot of believers that I know that even if a donkey walked up and told them, they wouldn't receive it. Because yep. I know, because I've walked... 
All right, so I'm going to go through. These are just Steve's. I almost like entitled this like Steve stuff. And then I thought, like, that's not very professional. Nobody's going to want to watch that on YouTube. So I called it something better. I don't even know what I called it. Lifestyle of truth. That sounds, that sounds pretty YouTube-y. So I was going to call it Steve stuff. Because I'm just going to give you, like, five things that I have learned in my own life. I'm not, I'm not saying, like, these are the top things. I mean, these are the most important things. I'm not saying any of that. I'm showing you in the scripture five things that I have learned that will help me walk out divine health. So I'm not talking to you about healing. We just talked about healing that's in the atonement, that's in the finished work of the, of the cross, that's in the blood and body of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where healing comes from. You have been healed. Amen. So now we're gonna, I'm gonna teach you a little bit about walking out divine health because our prophetic destiny is that we're gonna be the healthiest, the wealthiest, and most influential group of people in the region. And so it's my responsibility to teach you how to be healthy and wealthy and most influential. So number one, and these are in no particular order, even though this was the first one that came to me when the Lord said, let's do this today. Number one, Matthew chapter 15, verse four. And I believe that the number one way for most, for people to walk out are not even the number one. Let me not say that. I believe that this is a very important part about us walking out divine health. And the scriptures will bear that out. This is Jesus speaking, for God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curses father and mother, let him die the death. Die the death. Do, do you see the correlation between honoring father and mother and health? There are people in this room that, you, that God has radically wrecked your life and you've came into, maybe even in adulthood, you've came into repentance and you've accepted the salvation that God has been for you. And you were one of the most terrible children ever and you have never gone back to your parents and made it right. Amen. Now, I will say that it doesn't say in there, honor thy father and thy mother when they're perfect. Honor thy father and mother if they're the best ones on the planet. Honor thy father and mother when they deserve it. Notice there's no qualifiers on there. <laughs> Amen. Well, I mean, what does Jesus know? Let's go to Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. This is what we call the Ten Commandments. These are pretty important. Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Do you see the correlation between health and whether people are actually doing this or not? Now you might ask me, well, what do I need to do to honor my father and my mother? Let me just say this. You probably know what it looks like when you're dishonored. You know what it looks like when your children, I'm not looking at anybody, when your children are dishonorable. Now, let me say this uh, on purpose right here at this juncture. This current world, America 2021, basically has no clue of any kind of honor. It is gone. It's lost there's a few random weirdos like me that have like hung on tight because I see scripturally the benefit to honor. Um, I say yes ma'am and no ma'am to my mother. I say yes ma'am and no ma'am to a bunch of people in this room and sometimes they get mad. You know, don't call me a ma'am. Okay, do you want me to do the Bible honor thing or do you want me to succumb to your social pressures? I say yes ma'am, no ma'am, yes sir, no sir. If you don't like it, that's fine. Just reject it. But I'm going to live in honor. I'm not going to mistreat people just because it's societally okay right now. And so I, on purpose, I don't do this because this is some dictate that I have from the Lord and I need to be healthy and so therefore I'm going to honor mom. I can honor mom easy. Those of you that know her realize that she's worthy of all the honor that we could give her. 
Um, but I honor my father as well. You guys know that my, I honored my stepfather in here as well. I honor my stepmother. I have a stepfather who had just recently passed away, and I have a stepmother. So I have a father and a stepfather, and a mother and a stepmother. I honor all of them. And it's not because of what they've done or not done. I do it because it's the right thing to do. You know how, you know what our world would look like if everybody just did the right thing because it was the right thing? It, it's shocking to me sometimes that I have to literally explain this to people. You should do this. Well, why? They're, not, they're doing this. It, stop. It doesn't matter what they're doing. It doesn't matter what they're thinking. It doesn't matter. You do the right thing. Well, it's hard. Ta-da! Uh, and the last verse I want to cover on this, Ephesians 6, 2. The reason I want to put this in is because this is the Apostle Paul saying specifically that this was the only of one of the Ten Commandments that literally had a promise attached. And he's tying in the promise that is in this command to health. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise. And the promise is that you're going to live long on the land, Long life, you know, short life or an early death is a curse. Long life is a blessing. A Amen, said all the longer life people. <laughs> God wants you to live long and experience all the benefits of living long. If a life is cut off early, it's a curse. Now, am I saying every life that was cut off is because they didn't honor their father or mother? No, there's a lot of reasons that your life can be cut off early. But this one specifically says if you honor. It doesn't say, just look this up. I just want you to do this. You, you promised me that you'd let the Holy Spirit preach, and so I'm not going to preach. I'm just going to teach. But honor. Now, this is a Bible word that comes from our Father in heaven. He defines honor. Not society, not you, let God define honor. Go in there and look, and you'll figure it out. Okay, so that's the first thing, or one of the things that I covered first. That's a, that's a good way to say it. I figured it out. Okay, so one of the other things that I'm going to cover, I'm going to cover this one second. Again, this is just things that I have incorporated into my life really passionately in order for me to walk out divine health. Do I have it all figured out? No. Do I have symptoms that I would love to just obliterate in a second? Yes. Do I, uh, do I walk in a higher level of divine health than most people? Yes. I can't remember the last time I was sick. And, well, I can remember the last time I was sick. It happened in Africa. <laughs> I had... It was one of the, my favorite times like for the whole year was to go to Africa with Donna. If you, if you ever want to have one of the greatest times of your entire life, go to Africa with Donna. <laughs> Had a great time. And one of the things that I love, and this is just me, maybe this ain't true for you, but for me, one of my favorite things is the fact that in Africa, you can preach. They actually like it. They want you to preach for hours. <gasps> crazy because <laughs> they don't they, they, they went through a lot of effort to get to the room you know some of them walk uh, the first time I went to Africa there were people sitting in the room that walked 8 hours to come hear me and I was 20 at that point I was 24 years old I'm like I ain't got nothing to tell you at 24 and they walked 8 hours to come listen to me and so, man, I gave them all they wanted. And I figured out after about hour two that they were going to take more than I was going to give. I didn't have much more over two hours to preach back then. Don't you wish you were part of Beloved Church back then? <laughs> the last time I experienced uh, a sickness or a disease was in Africa. It was the last night that we were there. And I'm not going to get into all of it, but the point was I was preaching on the finished work of the cross, and that night I specifically preached on the healing part of the finished work of the cross, and I ripped it, and, a and probably everybody in that room, other than the folks that came with us, was the first time they'd ever heard anything like that, that they were healed 2,000 years ago. And it's a long story, and I'm not going to get into all of it, but there were some other things that were not quite right, 
uh, in some other areas and we got back to our hotel and I was like dog tired. Like we'd been sleeping four and five hours for like a week. Plus you had to go through all the COVID stupid on the airplanes and all the ridiculousness that goes with that. And plus we were riding back and forth to the village. It was like an hour ride in, a, in an old bus on a road that is kind of like Illinois roads. <laughs> um, you know, your diet is off and you're, you know, I like to work out you guys know that, and so none of that was, you know, I didn't have time for none of that, and it was just like 24 hours, and so we got back that last night, I was like, Whoa. and I'm like, I just wanna go to bed. And I got into bed, it was like one or two in the morning, I think it was late, it was one, and we had to be up early to get, to start the trek back to the airport, and I just wanted to go into bed, and I crawled into bed, and it literally felt like somebody had took two daggers and stuck them right into my kidneys in my back. I mean, I actually let out pain noises. Uh, it, was, it was supernatural. I mean, it was instantaneous and it was supernatural. If I laid down, I literally groaned. If I stood up, I screamed. I had to leave my room because I was concerned about waking people up. It was that bad. And I don't scream out for pain. Like, I can handle pain. I'm one of those guys. Uh, oftentimes, I know I'm bleeding because I just got blood all over everything I'm working on. And this was intense. I was in so much pain that I wanted to call Kay. <laughs> and in Africa, they, they like shut down like sometimes electricity, but oftentimes cell service from like midnight to 6 a.m. to conserve whatever sell energy you need to conserve, I guess. Um, and so I was like, I wanted to call, I couldn't even call my wife, and I'm like, oh, Jesus, I'm just gonna have to trust you. <laughs> Kay can't even help me. And I was, I was walking, and it was excruciating. I was bent over, and it was excruciating. I'd lay down, and it was excruciating. I, was, I went for a walk outside. I was laying in the grass trying to get, I could not stop it. My head was pounding, I was hot, I was cold, I was everything. And I was just like, I was praying in tongues, and I'm like, I am not, absolutely not gonna receive this. It lasted about two, three hours, and then as soon as it came, the way it came on me is the way it went off me. And I know it has a lot to do with the fact that what I was preaching and what I was releasing, but the point is, is that that's the last time that I can remember actually having something come on me. I try to walk out in my life at a high level of divine health. And here's one of the reasons is because I need to be instant in season and out, not only in the word, but also physically to be able to do whatever the Lord calls me to do. And I'm going to get into that in a minute. So the number two thing that, I, uh, that I've operated in in my life to maintain health, to walk in the divine health that Jesus purchased for me, it comes out of Matthew chapter 8, verse 9. Amen. For I am a man under authority, said the centurion. Does anybody remember who Jesus said had the most faith of anybody he ever came across? The centurion. His, his Greek faith was higher than all of the uh, Hebrew Jew faith. Now, that, that was one of the things that a lot of the folks that were around him were really offended. Like, how dare you say this centurion, this Greek has more faith than us, like we're the children of Abraham. He operated in more faith than everybody around him said, the Lord, I have not seen this kind of faith in all of Israel. For I am a man under authority, said the centurion, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, go and he goes, and to another come and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. And I used to, I used to kind of disconnect this, but there was something that the Lord highlighted to me about the centurion, specifically about the centurion's faith that we should all learn from. One of the reasons the centurion operated in the highest faith of anybody that Jesus came into contact was was because he understood authority. And, I, and I've heard a lot of people preach on this from the fact that he understood authority as if like he's a centurion, so he's in charge. Okay, anybody that's ever been in the military know that you don't just get into the military and you're a centurion. You're a grunt, you're a worker, you're shining somebody else's armor, you're 
you're picking up the other soldier's defecation because you got to do 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John ministry. You, you got to do all the stuff to get to one level, and then you got to do all the stuff to get to this level. This level, centurion, was one of the highest levels you could get to. So for him to get there, he had to do all this other stuff. And the Lord highlighted to me, it wasn't that he understood being in authority, is that he understood having been in authority. And if you missed what I said, that's one of the reasons. A lot of people want to be in charge. Because they think if I was in charge, I'd fix it all. You know how many people would complain, well, if I was in charge of this, I've ran restaurants almost all, all my life. And people would say, well, if I ran this restaurant, here's what I'd do. And I'm like, yeah, and it wouldn't be here. Because you don't have a clue. Because you don't know all the pieces. You don't know everything I have to deal with <laughs> to run this restaurant, to make things work. And people think that if they were in authority, well, if I was king, <laughs> thank God you're not. <laughs> well, if my wife ever actually listened to us, yeah, your family would be destroyed. <laughs> Thank God she's pushing back a little bit. We don't really understand what it's like to be in authority. In other words, somebody else is in charge and we submit. We don't understand submission. Here's how you know if you even have the beginning of a revelation of submission. If you are submitting to someone you disagree with. Anybody, everybody can submit to people they agree with. I completely agree with that. Let's do it. When you find out if you're actually in godly submission is when you disagree and you still have a pure heart with it. And I can count on one hand the number of people that I personally have relationship with that even have begun to have this. I learned this real young because I came into the kingdom realizing that I was a complete failure. Complete. When Paul talks about being chief of sinners, like, I get it. Like, I understood my complete inability to do anything good in my life. Which, honestly, is probably some of the reasons that I've, got, I've been able to go um, at least to this level. Because it, what holds most people back is that they're like, well, you know, I mean, I had an okay life, and then Jesus was like the cherry on top. Woohoo, I get to go to heaven now. No, you have to realize you have to be completely destroyed. There is no good thing in you. And completely flush the whole thing, and then let Christ build you in his image. And so one of the things that I, as I was a complete, total, utter failure, everything in my life was a wreck. And so when I came to Jesus, it was easy for me to say, however you want to do it, Lord, you're Lord, I'm not. Which, praise God, thank God that I came that way. But what I, uh, the benefits to that was because I knew I was so broken, I was so ignorant, I was so uh, uh, worldized, however you want to say that, I knew that I needed him to do it right in me. So I submitted specifically, I mean, Kay and I literally prayed and cried looking for someone to submit to. We asked people to disciple us, and they said, no, they didn't have time. We went to pastor, the pastor of the church, and, and, got, and he was a great guy, um, but he was just old. And he, it just, it wasn't on his, he gave us some books, you're like, here, read this and do this. And I'm like, Man, I don't need that. I'm so broken. I need someone to, like, take me and unbreak me and help me in life. We looked for it for two years, never found it. We did it ourselves just by tapes, endless tapes, all day, all night, because we knew that we had to put all the good stuff in us. Went to Bible college, and I'm like, this is it. I'm going to finally, and it still is the same thing. There's a lot of just religion and, and plastic, and we still couldn't find authentic people to just get under and sit at their feet and let them help us develop stuff, which is why you guys hear me talk incessantly about discipleship, because it was something that we could not find. And so uh, because of that, I have learned all through all that time that no matter what room I step into, I step in there and I am always got my head on a swivel looking for who's in charge. Because I know that if I find whoever's in charge and I submit to them that there is incredible blessings to this. And I can't, 
I can't spend a whole lot of time on this because every one of these things are, are a message in itself and that's what I'm just trying to drop these on you and let you deal with them. But some of the reasons that many people are, are in sickness and disease is because they never truly understood authority and submission. If you cannot submit, you will never be able to tell a sickness and a disease to submit to you because that sickness and that disease knows you are not operating in authority. I have to go on. Uh, Luke 7, 8 is the same thing. The, the centurion said something, but I want to, it's just a little bit of a different language. He says, having under me soldiers, I say unto one, go, and he, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. Having soldiers under me. Now, he said in the first one, I'm under authority. And then he said in this one, having soldiers under me. Authority works both ways. You have to learn submission and you have to learn authority. And it's not being a supervisor, it's not being a manager, it's not being a boss because you can bark orders. Because I can tell you most of the manager, supervisors, bosses that I have met in life, and I've been doing this for 20, eight, 30 years I have been in leadership of some form or another. And I can tell you that most of the managers and supervisors and bosses that I've seen in the world, I wouldn't put them in charge of my dog's poo. But because they show up every day and they're, and they're doing the right thing and because they're breathing and they can do cognitive functions in their brain, they're just put in charge because there's such a destitute of actual leadership. You just put somebody in charge because they show up all the time. And you keep showing up, eventually, sooner or later, someone's going to give you some place. Romans 13, 1. Let every soul. Let every soul. Now, this is such a weird way for the Lord to say this. Why does he say let every soul? Because submission is a soul thing. Obedience is a body thing. And I, I don't have time to tear this apart. But you can be in obedience in your body and not be submitted in your soul. Yeah. Yeah. This is Christianity, like wheels off. I'm telling you right now today. You guys are all obedient in your body. You're sitting there and you're listening to me, those of you that are awake. And that doesn't mean just because you're sitting there and you're obedient in the flesh means that your soul is actually submitted to what I'm saying which means that it's just going to bounce right off of you because you're Teflon and nothing sticks. Kapew! And you'll end up in whatever problems in your life. you say, well, you know, if my church was better, if that pastor was a better leader, I wouldn't be having this stuff going on in my life. Mm -hmm. You can submit and not be obedient. And you can be obedient and not be submitted. And if you don't know how to do those two things, you have got to go to the Lord and have them work that out. Okay, man, there is so much. That you, this, uh, I, I can't spend too much time. I got to keep moving. Let every soul be submitted unto the higher powers. This is a revelation to a gaggle of folks in this room. There are higher powers than you. I know, it's in the Bible. That's the only reason you're believing it right now because obviously it's like God and you. God actually ordains <laughs> and puts people in places of leadership. Does that mean that I am, uh, as the pastor of the church, that means I'm better than anybody? No. Does that mean that I have, a, I have more grace and extra angelic power or something? Like I can call down fire and you can just call down rain? No, it's none of that. It's same but different. My wife and I have equal authority in the body of Christ. We have equal authority in the home. The difference is, is that the authority that I have is in different areas than the authority that she has. Praise Jesus. And if I submit to her in the areas that she's in charge and she submits to me in the areas that I'm in charge, then together in our submission, our authority will be working appropriately. So if you don't submit to the, place, to the people and the places that God puts in your life, you are not going to have your soul prospering. 
He meant, this is why I've said this over and over. I'm going to keep saying it because it's still true. There's a, there's a bunch of folks that come to this church that I am not your pastor because you will not submit to the biblical version of what a pastor is. And I'm not fussing at nobody and I'm not telling you to do it because if you come up to me at the altar after today's message, I'm kicking you out. It has to be something between you and the Lord where you actually say, I believe that God actually did this. And I'm going to submit to what God has done in my life. I didn't, I didn't pick Kay out of a Cracker Jack box. God sent her to me and did all of this amazing stuff. And for me to mistreat her now would be me to directly mistreat God. And I recognize that. And so I'm going to allow the authority that God has placed. You know, this, I understand that this gets tenuous as you relate through stuff, but uh, I can't wreck my YouTube channel. What can I say? Any, anybody that's legally elected, does that work? Is that, anybody that's legally elected in our form of government, you have to submit to. Notice I didn't say illegally elected. But anybody that's legally elected in our government, you have to submit to. Does that mean you have to be obedient to them? No. There is civil disobedience, which means you're doing it civilly. You're not burning down downtown Detroit. You're not rioting and looting in Jesus' name. You're not... Uh, cussing people out because they're not wearing the same uh, Black Lives Matter t-shirt that you are. You're civilly disobedient. Right now, I'm civilly disobedient to what is going on in some of the places of our government. So does that mean I'm just going to take my gun and go shoot up the place and drive around 200 miles an hour and throw grenades out my window? No. That would be unsubmitted and disobedient at the same time. So here's what it is. I am going to, within the confines of the law, work however I possibly can to change our government to get other people rightfully inserted into places who are going to lead from righteousness, who are going to lead from godliness. I'm going to do everything I can in there. And if they ever walk through that door and they come in here and they say, Steve, it's the new law. You've got to take this woman to the abortion clinic so that she can get her baby murdered. And you've got to take these two gay folks and put them into holy matrimony right here at the altar. I will be disobedient and submitted. Because I will tell the official, I can't do that because that's murder, because God says it's murder. And I can't do that because it's an abomination, because God says it's an abomination. So if that means arrest me, I'm going to have me a good jail ministry. I'm okay with that. I'll go to jail for that. Because I'm going to be obedient and submitted to God. So I'm still submitted to them. I'm not going to kick them and yell at them and pull my gun out and do all the stuff. I'm like, like nope. That, it, you are here under authority of the U.S. government, so I'm going to submit to your title, but I'm not going to submit to the, I'm not going to be obedient to the action. Amen? Okay. I hope you got that. Because God has ordained, the last part of this is because the authorities that are there are ordained of God. So that means if I resist the people that God, mom is my mom. And I'm her pastor. So when we're together, I honor and submit to her as mom. And honestly, somebody who's probably got more Christianity, she's, she's got more accidental Christianity than 95% of the body of Christ does on purpose. And so I'm going to submit to her wisdom and, and, and her lifelong experience of walking this out through terrible circumstances. And she does this amazing thing where she submit, submits to me in some of the conversations that we have because she realizes that maybe I have a different revelation than she does. And she actually allows me to do that. We co-submit. I submit to her as mother. She submits to me as pastor. It, it is beautiful. Kay can do the same thing. It is so shocking to me that sometimes that we can be somewhere and I can speak and I know for a fact that she's listening to me as bride. 
And then I'll say something else one sentence later and she will listen to me because she is listening to her pastor. It is shocking the way she's able to do that. And then the next second I'll say something and she doesn't submit to none of it because I'm cutting up being funny and it's probably inappropriate. And she'll fuss at me later. So she's unsubmitted because I'm being carnal. It's like once a year, so don't get all... (laughs) Hebrews. Let's go back to the Bible before you guys get carnal. Hebrews 13, 17. And the reason I want to bring this up is because the word here, uh, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable. You see that word unprofitable? Now, uh, this is one of those verses that no pastor in front of his own church ever wants to preach. I'll tell you right now. This is a, a verse that I could go to somebody else's church and preach, and the pastor would be like, get up, preacher! <laughs> but no pastor wants to stand in front of his own church and tell you that this verse is in the Bible. Because it's telling you to obey me. And I don't want your obedience. I don't, I don't want your honor. I don't want your obedience. I want you to live in the truth. <laughs> and if you slash my tires on the way out, God will buy me new tires. But I want you to live in the truth. So I'm not going to avoid this verse because it's in the Bible. And just because it's awkward to stand up here and be the pastor and use this Bible. But I just want you to see this. Obey them that have the rule over you. And I know a lot of, there's no way that any pastor has the rule over me. And submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. That's my job. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. They watch for your souls as they that must give account. One of the reasons that I put up with a bunch of you is <laughs> because I got to give account. amen the Lord's going to say hey what did you do about Chris well I didn't kill him (laughs) the Lord's not going to say well way to go good and faithful servant no he's going to say what did you do for Chris's soul what did you do for his prosperity in his marriage what did you do for the prosperity in his emotions what did you do for him to make sure that he lives in divine health did you make sure that he was in the truth that he had access to the truth or did you reject it for him because you didn't, he wasn't going to like what you had to say because how many people reject the truth for someone else because you don't know how they're going to react and so you don't want to make an enemy and so you reject the truth for them because they are not going to receive it because you've already predetermined it That's a big one that I don't have time for. For they watch for your souls as they that must, must, not maybe. I know this. You guys don't know this. Maybe some of you do. But I know this verse. I have a pastor. I submit to him because I know this is his job. And I know he's going to have to give account for everything Steve does or doesn't do. And I am not going to make him have a bad moment in some kind of judgment because I acted a fool. Amen. Amen. I know that I am going to have to give account how I do this. This is why I'm seven days a week, 16 hours a day. And I didn't even, I probably shouldn't even have said that. But it is all day, every day that you guys are on my mind, that I am working diligently, that I'm trying to get better information, I'm trying to become a better leader, I'm trying to have more wisdom, I'm trying to have more revelation, I'm praying for you, I'm trying to get better at ministry, I'm trying to get better at communicating, I'm trying to write stuff down, I'm trying to be able to preach stuff, I'm trying to get better up because I am going to give account. And there ain't nobody that's ever going to stand, that's going to stand next to me while I'm standing in front of the Lord, and the Lord says, hey, did he... Uh, Did he do right by making sure that you had everything that you needed? Nobody's ever going to stand next to me and say, nope, he didn't tell me. He didn't show me. He wasn't available. He didn't have the information. Nobody. I am going to make sure that I know I'm given account. That they may do it with joy. (laughs) Please let me do it with joy. Please. (laughs) I'm begging you. (laughs) Let me do it with joy. I want to do it with joy. And not with grief. You see how quiet it got? The reason it got ever quiet is because a bunch of you are like, oh, that's me. 
<laughs> no, you don't give me grief. For, okay, for that is unprofitable for me. Are you seeing this? This is why I'm covering this verse. For you. It's not me. The Lord's going to take care of me. If, you, if nobody in here ever gives, the Lord will make sure Kay and I eat. If nobody in here ever honors me or appreciates me or loves me, it, it's irrelevant. The Lord appreciates me. The Lord loves me. The Lord secures me. Amen. So this, isn't, this is, has nothing to do about me. I'm going to do what the Lord asked me to do, whether there's two people in here or 2,000. I'm going to go where the Lord tells me to go. I'm going to let him be my affirmation. I'm going to let him be my lover. I'm going to let him do everything for me. Not because I need it from you. This would actually bless a bunch of you because you actually think that you need things. I need this person to affirm me. I need this person to say nice things to me. I need this person to accept me. If my boss only did it, da-da, if my spouse only did it, if my kids, you are, you are, your soul is broken. Because if the Lord affirms you and you need more than that, then you don't know Jesus. This word unprofitable, check this out, was only used one time in all of Scripture. One time. And this is the definition of it. Used only here describes the lost benefits from making a poor choice. Ruinous. Detrimental. It is used in classical Greek as a technical medical term for unfavorable symptoms. Oh, dear Jesus. I didn't even know this when I was doing this. But when I started to research, I'm like, oh, my Lord, this means if I submit to the people, God, that you put in my spiritual authority, that one of the things that I'll do is I will avoid detrimental medical things in my life, I'm in. That's why you know that I'm in a rarity uh, of actual pastors who sought out a pastor so I could submit. Because I know almost all my pastor friends, they can't say who their pastor is. <laughs> I sought out my pastor. Next time you see Pastor Rich, man, ask him about it. I called him. I wore him out. Like, will you please pastor me? I don't know. Yeah, he didn't do that. He, he, accept, he was really gracious. He accepted me. But he, he ask him how many people have called him asking him to be their pastors. Ask any pastor you know how many people are calling them, asking them to actually physically be their pastor. Not even other pastors, just actual people. I knew that this was part of this before I knew it. Because I knew that having things in the Lord's order was going to work to my health and to my soul's health. Uh, number three is, I'm just going to read through these verses because we did this. The third thing, I guess, is how I'd say this. Remember I said five? Yeah, we're not going to do all five. It's going to be a part two to Steve's stuff. Oh, no, wait, what I call it? Uh, something lifestyle... Cool. Yeah, lifestyle of truth. That's what I. That's what it is, A.K.A. Steve stuff. So there'll be a part two because I'm not going to be able to cover this because one of these by itself is like half the page. Ugh, man, there's some really good stuff. First uh, Corinthians chapter 11 verses 29 and 30. For he that eats and drinks unworthily, this is talking about communion or the Lord's Supper. He that drinks and eats unworthily, eats and drinks damnation to himself. Just so you know, like the Bible doesn't just throw around the damnation word. It's not like you picked your nose, you're damned. You were late to church, you're damned. No, damnation is like... It's a very unused term. So he that drinks of the cup, the communion cup, and eats of the bread of the communion, the Lord's Supper, and does it unworthily, drinks and eats damnation. I don't know if that's heavy to you, but that's one of the heaviest statements in all of Scripture for me. 
If the Lord says you're damned, that's not like, you know, your buddy at, at the shop saying, hey, damn you. No, if God ever says it, it's, it's not like the fun thing that two guys are doing because they're farting together. That, that means like, that's it, game over. You're done. Ethan drinks damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now, for those of you that don't know the book of Corinthians very well, the book of Corinthians also has uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 in it, which is the love chapter, and 1 Corinthians chapter 14, which talks about the prophetic. But what, you're, what most people miss is that 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 11, 12, and 13, and 14, all of them together are specifically talking about the local body, the fellowship of believers all together that, com that uh, when they're added together, comprise the Lord's body. We are his body, and so when you don't discern the Lord's body, or in other words, that's just the church I go to. Amen? You don't actually see this as part of the Lord's body where you are a part of it, and it's a part of you, and you're not discerning that you have a responsibility in the body. I didn't write this. So all of you that are like, I can't believe that Pastor Steve would say such a thing. If you're not connected to the local body and doing it right, then you're damned. Ah! You, you read it at home. That's why I said, I'm just going to teach them, and then you can go home and let the Holy Spirit preach it, because he'll preach it a lot harder than I do. Next verse, please. For this cause, many are weak and sickly, among you. You know, this is the only verse in all of the Bible that tells us why a person who was born again is actually sick and many sleep. That means die young. This is the only verse in all of the New Testament ever written to a believer that specifically says why you are sick and dying young. Because you're not honoring, discerning, recognizing the body that the Lord has placed you in. Uh, I'm sorry. For all of you that are like, I don't like that. I, I, you don't write Jesus an email and let him know that you disagree. Because if you send it to me, I don't know what, I, what do you want me to do. Like, I, I can't take these out of the Bible. And the fact that it's the only place in all of Scripture that specifically says to a believer what something could be causing you to live in a sickly or a shortened lifespan way is by not recognizing the body. I know you might be thinking, well, you're talking about the body of Jesus. Where's the body of Jesus? Well, it's in heaven. Jesus is in heaven. You're right. The head is in heaven. <laughs> but we are his body. He is the head, we are the body. So me living in contention or strife or unforgiveness or offense with, if I'm mad at Jeff, I have just on purpose reduced my lifespan or I have opened myself up to be sick. So you know, if, if anybody actually knew this, you know what the first thing they do? Oh my gosh, Jeff, I'm so sorry. Even, I don't know what I did or I don't know what happened, but I want to make sure that you know that, that I want this to be right. I want us to be in harmony. I want us to be in unity. If at all, if in any way that we can be reconciled, please let me do that. Because I am not going to live sickly or shorten my lifespan because I just want to be mad at Jeff over the thing that he did. Because thank God Jesus ain't mad at you over the thing you did. Amen? Amen. Or oh me. I got to stop because I was going to preach right there. I almost preached. Pulled it back. It's all for you, Holy Spirit. He's going <laughs> to. Steve stuff number two coming soon. All right. So please rise. I want to, uh, I want to bless you.
now please receive the blessing that the Father has for you. He calls you beloved, the ones that are greatly loved. And we, he and I both desire that you experience prosperity and his type of divine health. And the way this happens is by allowing your soul to prosper through intimacy with him and knowledge of his word. I love you and I'll see you again soon.